से और कहीं से सिर्फ एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन फॉर दी कंबाइंड कैंपस ऑफ बेंगलोर हाई साइंस क्लस्टर एज अ ब्रांच एडवाइजर मैडम करेंटली एच पी ग्रांट्स मैनेजमेंट एंड रिसर्च कोलाबोरेशन टीम ऑफ दी रिसर्च डेवलपमेंट ऑफिस एट द एम सी बी एस मैडम रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज इंक्लूड स्ट्रेटेजिक ग्रांट्स एडवाइस लीड टू डेवलपमेंट ऑपरेशन मैनेजमेंट स्ट्रेटेजी फॉर्मुलेशन ग्लोबल एंगेजमेंट मैनेजमेंट ऑफ गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया क्लियरेंसेस फॉर इंटरनेशनल फंडिंग और कोलाबोरेशन मैनेजिंग ग्रांट कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एंड ऑल्सो कोलाबोरेटिव रिसर्च एग्रीमेंट एंड ऑल्सो डेवलपिंग इंस्टीट्यूशनल पॉलिसीज इंपैक्टिंग ग्रांट्स एंड ऑल्सो डेवलपमेंट ऑफ दी टीम रिसर्च डेवलपमेंट ऑफिस मैडम इज ऑल्सो एक्टिवली इन्वॉल्व इन आउटरीच टू डिफरेंट फंडिंग एजेंसीज एंड इन ऑर्गेनाइजिंग एंड पार्टिसिपेशन इन ग्रांट राइटिंग फंडिंग फॉर साइंस करियर वर्कशॉप सो इट इज ब्रीफ इंट्रोडक्शन अबाउट मैडम सो ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ ऑल ऑफ यू ऑन माई ओन बिहाफ कर्नाटका साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी अकेडमी एंड वी टी यू बेलगवी वन वेलकम टू यू मैडम फॉर गिविंग दिस टूडे सेशन Thank you, Dr. Shrinivas, for the introduction. Uh, yes, I am primarily from <coughs> the life sciences background. Apologize, I do have a sore throat, so occasionally you will see my voice going. <coughs> so. What I've been asked to do is to talk to you about grant writing, and I'm not going to go into too much details about the science of grant, uh, of grant writing. I'm going to talk about basically how it should you approach uh, grant writing, uh, and what are the resources available that you can tap into. So before I start my talk, uh, I know that most of your research scholars, uh, so uh, how many from life sciences background? Uh, how many are research scholars? Uh, any faculty or early faculty? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, before I start, uh, I work at the I head the grants and research collaborations team of the research development office of the Bangalore Life Science Cluster, and this is a cluster of four uh, four institutions. So that is uh, National Center for Biological Sciences, then Institute for Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine. Then Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms and Tata Institute of Gen Fiction Society, which is a very recent addition to the Bangalore Life Science Cluster. Now, together, if you look at the range of uh, science that is covered, it's from basic all the way to translation and innovation. That's a whole range of uh, research that is carried out at the Bangalore Life Science Cluster. So, now this would be overall my presentation outline. Uh, what is grant writing? And why you should write a grant? Uh, how do you prepare for your uh, prepare and plan for your grant application? What's the groundwork for developing your grant application? And then other considerations and some useful resources that I'll leave you with. So, what is grant writing? Now, if I ask you if uh, any of you have written any grants uh, before, your faculty. So research scholars usually, I know, don't need to write too many grants. Uh, they qualify their uh, fellowship, uh, CSIR, NET, or whatever you call it. You have your fellowship. You're not really concerned about grants at this stage because your fellowship is covered. Uh, but at a later stage, as you go into your doi doing your research, you know, as, as, as a postdoctoral fellow, if you're going for research further or as you become a faculty, 
grant writing is very important. And what exactly is it? It's the practice of completing an application process for financial grants, which is provided by an institution. It could be a government department, it could be a corporation, foundation, or church. Grant writing is any application that goes out requesting for funding. Now, why should you write such a thing? So, uh, of course, uh, you need uh, the major uh, reason why you would write a grant is for funding, right? Whether it is for, pers uh, for personal support, if you're writing a postdoctoral grant application, you're really requesting for your own fellowship. Uh, or it could be for research, or it could be travel. You, have, you have meetings to attend, conferences overseas that you want to attend. You write a grant application for travel award, right? That's probably the kind of grant as research scholars we would be more uh, used to, right? But that's not the only. That's a very small part of what kind of grants you would be writing. Now, it is, of course, an opportunity to, de to demonstrate independent thinking, and it helps you hone your research ideas. You have a research idea, unless and until you put it in paper. If, you're, if it's there in your head, it's very diffuse. If you want to make it concise, you want it to be, uh, to, uh, you know, focus your ideas, to hone your research ideas, you should put it down on paper. And a grant application will help you do that. Uh, it helps you get feedback from the scientific com community, which helps you refine ideas. And by scientific community, I mean, uh, it's not always that you would get uh, reviews back from reviewers who have reviewed a grant application, but it goes a long way if you can get feedback fro for your grant application before you submit it. And when you say feedback, it could be your peers, it could be anybody who's uh, your supervisor, it could be any research expert in the field. And I can tell you that more often than not, if you approach a scientist and say that I have this research idea, can you, uh, that I am putting for so-and-so grant, that they might help you refine that idea, right? Uh, and gaining experience at proposal writing is very important, especially if you uh, want to stay in research. So then uh, <coughs> this is your first step towards getting funding for your continued research. And of course, it's great for your resume, right? Uh, now, where to look for funding information? I think this is where many people struggle. How do you find what you can apply for, right? Of course, talking to colleagues and mentors is usually a very, uh, is the first step that most of the people are used to. You know, you have seniors, you have, uh, you know, uh, early faculty who've just joined. You talk to them, okay, I have applied for so and so. So that's a very good way of uh, getting information. But that's not a complete information, right? Because people's needs, researchers are different and their needs are very different, right? So talking to colleagues and mentors is the first step that people generally uh, go to. But there are also individual agency websites. So if you have, if you know which agency you want to apply for, or you know a few agencies, uh, then you can go to their websites and they have detailed information. You can follow the social media, media channels of the funding agencies, which is, which is very upcoming nowadays because they all, most of the funding agencies have become very active on social media. So LinkedIn and uh, Twitter, if you can follow their handles, you can get updated information when new schemes come up, right? And many of these funding agencies also have newsletters and that also, that could be at different frequencies. It could be quarterly, it could be yearly, but the funding agency newsletters also you can have a, they have a subscription list and it's free usually, so you just apply, you subscribe to those uh, funding agency newsletter subscriptions and you get updated information as and when new schemes are announced. You can attend presentations by staff from funding agencies, so wherever you are organized, if, uh, wherever you are based, <coughs> if uh, they can invite some of the funding agency staff and sometimes these funding agencies also organize road shows <coughs> and those are very good important uh, places where you can actually directly interact with staff from the funding agency. And that's usually a very good way of making connections with the funding agency. Uh, <coughs> then what I'm going to talk a little bit more about are the funding scheme compilations and funding databases. And what do I mean by that? So there are many places where which curate this information about what is the funding available, right? Uh, one of the examples, of course, uh, are the institutional funding databases. So different institutions compile information or curate information of funding schemes, which are usually curated in keeping in mind the researchers in their organization. Uh, one of the ones that I want to point out is, of course, our own uh, funding database. Uh, so 
we uh, as a research development office uh, do compile a funding database which is an open source and anybody can access uh, then you have iit palakkad which also has a has curated a funding database i think this is uh, this is also open source then you have one from the indian institute of science it's not open source but again this is an example of how institutions are trying to provide information to their researchers right uh, <coughs> the other resources which i highly recommend if people are as i understand mostly from a uh, life science background is the india bioscience now this is a website which curates a lot of information and not only about funding schemes if you are interested in careers in science they have resources for that uh, they have several resources for grants uh, fellowship opportunities and also job opportunities so that's one uh, website that i highly recommend uh, they do have a resource uh, for uh, uh, grants and you would find that you know they will have a short ex uh, description of what this uh, uh, funding scheme is about and what's the agency and what's the deadline right and we've also recently collaborated with them uh, to uh, take out two resource booklets one is the means to beginning this is the first uh, booklet that uh, india by science took out and uh, this was for funding opportunities for phd students and postdocs in india mostly uh, caters to life sciences uh, so that's one and following on from this they also have another a uh, booklet which has come out for early career faculty so independent researchers so they have two resource booklets like this and of course the idea is that it will get updated on a regular basis <coughs> the other of course is government of india itself is making effort to make information available to uh, the indian community and two of these websites that i would like to point out is one is of course the government of india funding agencies themselves have portals and an example here is the serb project information system and management serb prism which was launched uh, just a couple of years ago and this has a very good information about what all are the funding schemes that are available the other again i that i would highly recommend is the one on the left which is the india science technology and innovation isti portal again a very good useful resource of research projects which are funded it also gives you a whole list of funding schemes not only from dst like the D the serb manage uh, the prism will mostly give you uh, information about the serb schemes or the dst schemes whereas the isti portal will have a much larger repertoire of grant funding in information out there so so now that you know you know where to get information about funding scheme now you've decided on what uh what is the uh, scheme that i want to apply for which is the agency i want i want to apply for and there's a lot of prep work that goes before you actually put a reach an application stage which gets ready for submission and the step one before you even finalize a funding agency the step one is to find ideas gaps and limitations in literature what is it that you are going to do which is unique which is not been done before of course you cannot repeat something something that has been done somewhere else right so you have to identify a gap that you want to address right and now that you have identified what funding scheme you want to apply for understand the goal of the funding and why are you writing this grant application what do you want to achieve if you put in this application is successful what do you plan to achieve out of this right <coughs> so these are just getting your thoughts together this is even before you've started writing process right so this is what you need to do to get yourself ready to write a grant application then comes the actual ground work of planning your grant application so you have to do some background research on the funding source you have to understand the background of the funding uh, body you have to have some idea about the competition and the scheme you have to match your needs with the funder because all funding agencies will not fund everything they most of them have a remit that they want to submit so uh, that they want to support so does your application or your idea fit to the uh, remit of the funding agency and who has secured past funds and why this is important is of course because it gives you an idea of what kind of uh, you know <coughs> what is it that the funding agency is looking for in a particular scheme so it will have usually an abstract of the pro of the funded project it gives you an idea of how you want to tailor your grant application 
Now I'm going to break each of one of these towns separately and go over it in some a little bit of detail. So understand the background of the funding body. What do I mean by that? You go to the funding agency <coughs> uh, uh, website and what you'll see is that there is a whole series of uh, funding schemes. Which one do you want to apply to, right? Which one is best suited for your needs? So those kind of information you'll definitely get on the India Alliance website, which is just one example. This is a <coughs> collaboration between Wellcome Trust and the uh, Department of Biotechnology, and it uh, funds mostly biomedical research from postdoctoral level and above, right? So why I say go to the funding agency's website is not only to see what is the scheme, it also gives you information about what is the committee, right? What is the committee which is going to review your grant application? Gives you a list of committee members, and that really helps you because you can go back and check the background of these committee members, gives you a fair idea of what kind of uh, expertise they have and how much you need to, how you need to uh, present your own proposal, right? Uh, so the same, the India Alliance and then the SERB also provides uh, publicly its committee structures. So these are very good idea about background research on the funding agency per se. Now, you need to have an idea about the competition and the scheme. And what do I mean by that? Uh, are these applications accepted all through the year? That means you can plan at your own time scale or whatever your time scales are. You know, I want to finish my PhD by so and so time and I need to apply and start getting postdoctoral funding by so and so time and applications are accepted all through the year. I can uh, plan my work according to my time scale, right? So that, of course, you'll get to know from there. There are, of course, schemes which have deadlines, right? So there are schemes which are all through the year and <coughs> there are schemes which have deadlines. That means you have to tailor your grant, your timelines based on when is the deadline. So if the deadline is three months from now, you're going to start planning now. You can't say that maybe, you know, I'll start planning three months later, right? Because there is a deadline towards which you're preparing. <coughs> Again, that's information you'll get on the agency website. This is just an example of DBT. You see that there is uh, funding schemes and they'll give you an idea of what you need to, what is the deadline and what you need to aim for. Right? Again, like India Alliance seems to be my favorite uh, that I like to highlight all the time because it's very well structured uh, uh, website. So again, it will give you what is the launch date, what is the deadline, right? So that gives you an idea of how you want to prepare for your grant application, and what are the time scales you're looking at, right? Uh, now, what do you look for scheme details? Scheme details, sometimes they are very long, sometimes they are very short. What should you look for when you read a scheme, what a funding scheme, right? What is the scheme specifically intended for? Again, taking example of uh, the India Alliance, I say that their remit is biomedical research. So anything, if you are talking about saying that you will do crop improvement, then India Alliance is not the agency for you, right? So you have to see what the scheme is looking for and what are the resources provided as part of the scheme. You only want, uh, okay, you have your own fellowship. Now you're only looking for, uh, you know, uh, something, uh, some funds to support your research project, right? So what is, what are the resources that you want and what is it that the scheme is offering? And how long is the support offered for? Is it three years? Is it five years? Is it two years? You need to know because you have a specific project in mind. You know how long it's going to take, right? You have to be realistic in in, in saying that, okay, I have this project, this will only take three years, I need money only for three years. And what do I need? I need some consumables, I need two small equipment, and maybe I need a, a, a one manpower, maybe a technical assistant to get this done. And this will be done in three years. So you have to be realistic when you propose a grant application saying that depending on the duration of the scheme, your project should also be realistically be able to be done in that time scale, right? And why I emphasize on this is because many funding schemes, many grant applications will now actually ask you actively for providing timelines or the Gantt chart of how, what are your milestones and how are you going to achieve it and how is it distributed over a period of the grant uh, scheme, right? Then, of course, you need to know, are you eligible to apply? 
parents, you are eligible to apply if the institution that you want to host is in, are they eligible to apply, right? So these are some of the eligibility checks that you need to do before you even go into the details of what the scheme offers. First thing is, are you eligible and is the institution you are going to host it in eligible, right? So these are some of the scheme things that you should look in a scheme detail, right? Match your needs with the funder. Again, it's most agencies have list of recent awards uh, and these are actually very useful references when you want to uh, plan your new application, right? Gives you an idea of what is it that the uh, funding agency is looking for and prepare your grant application accordingly. As just a few databases, again, uh, the DBT has a project database uh, on promise, uh, which is their online portal. Uh, they all, uh, DSC uh, issues this annual report. It's good to go and they will say what all projects have been funded. So it's very good to go to the DSC annual report and see what is the, because also recently as we've seen from the COVID pandemic, the funding priorities of agencies also change and annual reports will actually report what was done in the previous year or what they plan to do maybe in the next year. So that gives you the research priority, right? Uh, then the SERP project information system and management not only has a funding database, it also has information on research outcomes. And that's very, it is also, it also has a very pictorial view. It also has lists. So it's a very good uh, database to see. And then of course the, uh, the DPT Welcome Trust India Alliance has a fellows page. So basically it gives you summary view of who all are the fellows who have been awarded and what is a short abstract of what they plan to do with that fellowship application, right? What is the proposed feature? Now, the rule of thumb when you develop a grant application, it's not that you write and you'd be done, right? It's usually write, then send it out to peers or send it out to experts, get their review, rewrite, and maybe rewrite again. But write, rewrite, and rewrite till your grant application is at the stage where you are happy with it and you feel that it can go somewhere. And when I say you are happy with it, you know, if you are the only person writing the application, only person looking at the grant application, you'll always be happy, right? <laughs> you need to send it out to people who are maybe, you know, uh, mix and match, people who are in your field, people who are not in your field also, because the perspectives of people who are not in your field is very different. They might point out things that for you are very obvious, may not be for a reviewer, because you have to remember that the reviewers who are reviewing your grant application are from diverse backgrounds also, right? So you have to think not only on being technically very correct, but also to make sure that your idea shines through in your grant application, right? So get feedback, get feedback from mentors, get feedback from peers, colleagues, other students, no, it need not be, you know, you are a senior student, you can uh, approach a first year student and say, read it and do you tell me what you understand out of it. Do you understand, does this make sense to you, right? So those are the kind of things that I would generally advise that you seek feedback. Feedback is very important. Now, what are the key co components? And I'll try to just go over what a grant application looks like. Generally, this is going to be a very generic view. Each grant application has its own way of uh, how it is arranged and what information the funding agency is looking for in that particular scheme. But more often than not, these are the things that you will get. You will have a technical content, which is what I call the meat of your proposal. This is your idea. This is what you're seeking, in, uh, seeking funding for. Then there is budget. And that what happens more often than not is people neglect the budget, but you, rea you fail to uh, realize that you are writing to a funding agency to get funding pro for the project. And if you have not through thought through your budget of what resources you are required, it's, it, it is going to impact your research, your proposed project, right? And then there will be other supporting documents that varies according uh, to what the agency is looking for. But if it is a research grant, you would have an institutional endorsement or other supporting documents. That's what it goes into, right? Now, there are scientific content. Now, when you are developing your research question, you have to ask yourself a few questions. Is this fundamental or hypothesis, uh, fundamental hypothesis driven science? And if that is so, then is that what the agency is going to support, right? 
because there are certain agencies which require a translation component. And if you are, if you are, the research question is fundamental hypothesis-driven science. You should not apply for funding agencies which will support translational uh, research or expect some sort of a translational outcome or a possibility of an outcome of a translational outcome, right? Uh, is it intellectually and conceptually challenging? This is very important to get uh, to get the interest of the reviewers, right? Is it feasible? You are proposing something. You are saying that it will. It, uh, this is a three-year project. What you are proposing is it feasible within that time frame? You have to be. You should not be over ambitious when you are writing a grant application. And I say this from personal experience because I have done that. Uh, my first postdoc grant application I wrote was something that. I wanted to do X, Y, and Z, and the reviewers come back and say, this is a two-year grant. You really, you realistically think you can achieve this in two years. And that was the first time I realized, okay, <laughs> I was probably too uh, over-ambitious. And being over-ambitious in a grant application can also work against you, right? So you have to make sure that what you propose should be feasible within the time frame that you are proposing, right? Uh, does it have a coherent strategy? Are you all over the place? You should not be, right? If you have a go research goal in mind, then there should be a path, right? It should be coherent. It should be understandable to you. It should make sense, right? And what is its significance or outcome, right? Uh, what, what do you finally aim to say that at the end of a three-year period of this, once I finish this research project, what is it that I aim to achieve? What is my end goal, right? And this a thing about it being interesting, feasible, and acceptable is something that you should always keep in mind. That when you write a grant application, these are some of the things that you should always uh, aim for, right? Now, if you break down further into the scientific content, usually uh, these are some of the things that you will encounter, right? Uh, what is the overview of the research background? So what is being done in the field, right? Uh, what is the rationale? Why do you want to do this? this particular project that you did. What is the current status of research and development in, subject, in this subject area? Now, if it is something that has been extensively worked on and there are really no uh, obvious gaps, then that's not a project that you should really propose, right? Uh, aims of the proposal. So the aims of the proposal should actually be designed in such a way that they address the gaps, right? This is being done, but I feel that this is the gap in this research area, this is what I want to uh, what I want to address. And how do you plan to address that? What's your work plan? What's your experimental design? What are the methods that you will utilize? And mind you, when you ask for a work plan, you don't say that I will put, uh, I will take a beaker of 500 ml and then I will put 20 ml of this and this and then I'll boil it to that much temperature and then I'll put uh, X. That is not what they're looking for. What they're looking for when you say an experimental design uh, or work plan is, what are the approaches that you're going to use? I'm going to use uh, high throughput sequencing, right, to address so and so, right? These are the techniques that I will use. This is how I will use, and this will be, this will be my control, this will be my uh, test samples, and why I'm using, proposing that as a test sample, right? Uh, but, you know, you're proposing various things. It's not likely that everything succeeds, and that is acceptable, right? You are talking about an hypothesis which has not been done so far. It's possible that some of it might fail, right? So then if that happens, what is your alternate strategy? Have you thought through it? Is there an alternate strategy? Okay, this technique did not work. If this did not work, what am I going to do? What is my fallback option, right? Uh, what are the timelines? Again, timelines are very important because it gives the reviewer the confidence that what you're proposing, you have thought through and you know how much time each of these it will take and it is feasible within the time frame that uh, the funding agency is going to uh, support you for, right? And the other thing that they will assess is what is the expertise of the applicant to execute the proposed work. Now, if it's a grant application for a research program, it's possible that you are trying to, uh, to venture into new fields, right? You may not uh, have the experience. But what you need to give confidence to the reviewer is, I have the, uh, these are my expertise. This is how it is going to be used in the proposal. And say I don't have expertise for a particular technique, I will collaborate or I will approach so-and-so. So that gives a very 
clear idea to the reviewer. This is your background. Okay, you have the expertise to do X, Y, Z. But if you have A, B, C to be done, and you don't have the required expertise, you have a place or you have identified a person or a place where you can get that expertise so that you can do this, right? And that also shows that you are trying to venture out of your comfort zone to do something new. So that is basically carving your research path, right? So this is something that you will encounter. I'll just go over it very quickly. Uh, the scientific content, the introduction. So that's always, even if you're writing a thesis, you start with an introduction, right? So the introduction starts with highlighting the background of the research and the origin of the proposal. You mention the gaps and importance and necessity of the research topic, right? Mention focused information only. You don't have to, because there's usually a word limit. So you have to ensure that you only give very concise information. You have to keep the reviewer in mind when you write a grant application. Are you providing too much information? Because these are reviewers who would be at any given point of time, maybe reviewing 30, 40 applications. If you, if you go rambling on to various things which is not relevant to what you want the reviewer to focus on, that is going to be to act negatively for your grant application. So you have, when you write a grant application, always keep the reviewer in mind, always keep the reader in mind, right? At the end, mention the study aim and objective, right? This is, this is overall what has been done. These are the gaps, and this is what I want to do. Literature review, again, develop the foundation laid in the introduction, Mention the, mention the critical outputs and contributions of previous studies. Add your own critical review of literature. You have read the literature, but maybe you interpreted it in a certain way, which helped, which made you uh, think of your research project a certain way, right? So add your own critical review of literature and keep always keep the research questions in mind when you're writing a literature review. Do not deviate from your topic. Uh, again, then comes the objective where you're actually defining your research project, right? What, what is the a broad objective and what is your key hypothesis that you're going to address? Divide the broad objective into three, four specific aims and uh, objectives. I do not recommend that you do too many objectives and sub-aims, right? It kind of dilutes. So there should be, say you have three-year project, you have three aims in mind, and maybe each aim can have one or two sub-aims, but don't make it each aim having six to seven sub-aims because it just dilutes your focus of your grant application, right? And they should be very specific, right? They will, they will serve as an evaluation criterion at the monitoring stage. Introduction, uh, review literature is not really your application, what you plan to do. So these are the things that the reviewers will look at very closely, right? Then again, the work plan details of how the objectives will be addressed and explain the rationale behind the choice of methods. Uh, supported with research. If you have preliminary data, that's good, but not every scheme asks for preliminary data, right? But if you have preliminary data, it helps. Uh, mention the required facilities, infrastructure, labware, and other capital in intensive schemes. Now, if you're looking at a postdoctoral application, you are going to be based in some mentor's laboratory, and that mentor's laboratory will be in some research organization. You have to critically evaluate that what you are proposing for your research proposal do you have all the infrastructure in place? Because that's also another thing the funding agency will consider. You have proposed a project and uh, where you're going to host it, does it have the infrastructure and the resources and the services to support that project, right? So that's also uh, important. The time schedule of activities giving milestone, milestones to a bar gram or a Gantt chart, and then alternate strategies that I've mentioned before, right? Again, the expected outcome and output of the proposal. What are the products, services, or facilities that would result uh, as an outcome from the project activities? What are the benefits? Why, are you want, why do you want to do this? What are the benefits that may happen from the project activity? They should be highlighted. And you should su suggest a plan of action for utilization of research outcome expected from the project. It, if it's basic research, it's possible that there is no outcome as a translational outcome, but there could be an uh, outcome saying that this is going to, uh, you know, define or mm, give insight into new areas of so-and-so. So that will, uh, that will be the cornerstone for further research, right? That, so it's not that all the, when you talk about outcome, it always has to be a translational outcome. It is not the case. 
it has to be an outcome which is a very clear outcome of what you do and what it is going to benefit right why do you want to do this research at all now just because i am interested in this is not a outcome of it right it's not the reason why you're writing a grant application you're writing a grant application hoping to for it to fund a research that will have some output it will be it could be a knowledge generation it could be a translational outcome it could be either one of them but what do you see as a benefit out of it right biodata of the investigator like i said is a crucial component it should summarize the expertise of the applicant to execute the proposed work provide details of any fun previous funding successes if you have had it helps the funding agency saying oh okay it's not the first grant you know how to write a grant application you have secured grant funding before that means you have been peer reviewed right and provide details of relevant publications again it also gives a confidence to the reviewers that you have published your research you have been peer reviewed right now presentation style uh, this is something i always emphasize is it should be easy to read and it should be well written so always a easy to read and a well written grant application has higher chances chances of success for ease of reading so you have to again make sure that you do not use too many abbreviations and acronyms if you are in the field there are certain acceptable acronyms that you may be very familiar with but it's not possible it's not always ex uh, expected that people who are reviewing your grant application know your acronyms or your jargon right so when you use an abbreviation define it at the first instance when you use it and then you can follow through on the same abbreviation but still maintain minimize the use of abbreviations and acronyms spell out all acronyms on the first reference right so that if people don't know what this means they can always go back to when it was referred first and find out what it was right make your points as direct as possible do not beat about the bush nobody has the time to you know extract uh, relevant information when you have uh, provided a very diffuse information you should not do that uh, write simple and clear sentences it's not a literature uh, it's not a literary work right it is something that you are writing so that people understand that it doesn't have to be very flowery or uh, using very difficult words it's not required what you need is that they should be sentences should be simple and they should be clear so that there's no ambiguity in what you're saying and what the uh, what the reviewer is getting right avoid technical jargon this is something i know that would uh, irritate people who are reviewing your grant application right the proposal should be clear and free from contradictions now this is something that you have to be that is why feedback helps because you have said something earlier on in the grant application and then later on you are saying something which contradicts what you have said earlier so you should not have contradiction and sometimes it's not so obvious to you when you're writing because your mind is thinking your brain is thinking in a certain way and you are reading a proposal in a certain way it's like you have a word and if a couple of letters are jumbled but if the first word and the last uh, first letter and the last letter are fine you can still read that word even if it's jumbled in between that's how your brain perceives it right but when you write a grant application for you that perception is a negative right so get feedback from somebody else who will read it and say oh you know but you said this here and now you're saying that this is not possible so that contradiction can be picked up if you let other peers review this grant application right use active rather than passive voice this is just a suggestion because an active voice is more stronger this will be done or i will do this you know i will do this always has a stronger impact than this will be done right so active rather than passive voice and be consistent uh, with terms references and writing style don't be all over the place again this is another place where a feedback helps no typographical errors misspellings grammatical mistakes or sloppy formatting that is a big put off so make sure that you do your spell check you do your grammar check all those are very important and there are a uh, lots of tools available now such as grammarly where you can do this right even word itself has spell checks and other checks that you can do and always allow someone with fresh eyes to read your content because all the things that i have written here may be very obvious to you and it will miss your attention but somebody else who is reading it with fresh eyes may catch it right budget 
again, like I said, this is something that people usually leave for the last minute, but you have to realize that this is very important part of your grant application because this is the scientific content is the meat of your proposal, but you are writing this grant application for the funding and funding has to be thought through very care carefully as well. Uh, so what I would say is give yourself sufficient time to plan your budget. Don't keep it last minute. Make budget on Excel sheets. It reduces the amount of errors that happen in calculations if you're doing it manually. And do not under-resource or over-resource your grant. Be very clear on what uh, is your project. What are the resources you need? Don't ask for less. Don't ask for more. Ask for what is exactly right, right? So if you have a proposed an experiment, you say I need two microscopes and it can be done by one microscope, just ask for one, don't ask for two, right? So that's uh, just an example of what I mean, don't over-resource your project, right? And provide justification for costs under each category. Now this is something that I feel many of the uh, early career researchers struggle with when you say justification. What do you mean by justification, right? You say consumables, you say I will have glassware, plasticware and, uh, and maybe some tissue culture media. That is not a justification, that's a description, right? So you have to be very careful when you say justification, you're saying why you need it, right? You have glassware because you have a lot of tissue culture experiments, maybe for AIM-1 or AIM-2 and we will be using these glassware for so and so experiments, it is required. Why do you need a particular antibody, you can explain that. Right? An explanation of why you need a particular resource is a justification, not a description of what the, what, what is, is there. What are you asking for? I will be asking antibodies is not a justification. Right? Why do you want antibodies? What kind of antibodies do you need? And what experiment will it address? That's your justification. Right? But again, don't go overboard with the justification also. If you are saying that you will have glassware, you don't break it down to I will have 50 ml beakers and 200 ml beakers and you know a liter beakers and then I'll have glass dots. You don't need that. You say glassware, it is glassware for what purpose? That's your justification, right? <coughs> again, when you develop your grant application and your budget, again, uh, be very clear about what is your funding cap. If a funding agency will only give you 50 lakhs, don't ask for a crore, right? So make sure that what you ask is based on what is the maximum funding the funding agencies will offer in that particular scheme. There are allowed versus disallowed costs, right? And when I say disallowed costs, for example, you do a lot of field work, you don't say that I will go and buy a, maybe a Jeep, right? That would be a disallowed cost, right? But if you say that I will rent a Jeep because I have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, field work for which I will need transportation and this is a valid uh, requirement, that, uh, that would be most likely an ad, uh, allowed cost, right? So you have to be very careful of what it will or it will not. If you are talking about postdoctoral grant applications, many often, more often than not, you will find postdoctoral applications will give you maybe a contingency, a small amount of contingency or research grant, what they call, and your fellowship. You can't ask for equipment, right? If you can't ask for equipment, don't, uh, don't ask for it because it's something that the funding agency will not provide, right? So it's just an example of being able to read through the guidance and, 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 and only ask for what the funding agencies allow, right? And again, if you are based at an institution, are there any costing norms that the institution follows, that you should be following, right? Like for example, you are asking for nowadays, of course, BHT has come up with a detailed guideline of what kind of scientific manpower can be recruited on grant, right? But before that happened, there were some, like you want something like a field worker. Now that is not there in a DST guideline. Then in that case, is there an institutional norm that applies in that case, right? Okay, a field worker can be given maybe 15,000 or a month or 20,000 a month. If that is an institutional norm, go for that, right? Again, use the budget in a prescribed format. All funding agencies, all grant schemes have their own format for a budget. Use the format, don't use your own. And scientific justification is crucial for why you need resources that you are asking for. Now these are just some of the budget heads you'll see and they're divided into non-recurring and recurring costs. Non-recurring are ones that you ask in your first year and you don't ask year on year, right? And those usually are the equipment and infrastructure. That is usually asked in the first year and if you have a three year grant, there is usually a limit within which you have to, you say that you will purchase it in year one 
you have to make sure that you purchase it within year one or maximum within 18 months of your grant. There is a time limit within which you have to, because you cannot say that if it's a three-year grant, I will purchase this equipment in year three. That is not allowed, right? And the recurring cost, you have this uh, manpower, or rather the gender neutral one, personnel, uh, consumables, contingency, travel, overhead, and other costs. Now, I will go over some of these. Uh, the other costs. So what do you mean by other costs, right? Now, consumables, if you have to uh, access a facility, if you have uh, facility access charges, so those are not consumables, nor are they contingency. But they are a, uh, they are a direct cost for your research, they can fall under other costs. And many of these funding agencies do offer this others category where you think that if it doesn't fall into any of the categories above, it falls under other costs, right? Uh, other thing that you have to be care, uh, clear about when you are developing your grant application is the matter of regulatory clearance. It is not required right at the time you are putting your grant application together, but it will be required if it gets awarded. Right? And you have to be aware of this right at the time you are writing your grant application. What are the regulatory clearances that you will require? So regulatory clearances, when are they needed? If you are working on recombinant DNA, you will need biosafety clearance from your institution or institutional committee. Right? Uh, if you are working on transgenic animals or any other animals or you are working on human samples or subjects or you have stem cells, all of these have regulatory committees which are mandatory to be uh, established within an institution and you need clearances for this before, so your, if your grant is awarded, if you don't have these approvals, you will not be able to start your project. So it's something that you have to plan ahead and again it depends on how your institution runs these institutional committees and how many times these committees meet in a year. So you have to plan your applications for these in that, in that time frame, right? Then of course these are the uh, these are the institutional committees like the in, uh, the institutional biosafety committee or the institutional animal ethics committee. These are at the institutional level. Some of these will go into the national levels. Uh, these insti these institutional committees will have to report to the national committees, which are the ICGM, the GEAC, CPC, FDA. These are for animal ethics and others. And this is something that you need to do. In addition to this. If the application is for international collaboration or exchange and you are based in an institution which is funded by the government of India, any nodal ministry, you will need to seek clearances from that nodal ministry before you can uh, embark on this. So this is what you call the government clearance from the security sensi uh, sensitivity angle. And this is something which applies especially if you are in a government funded uh, institution. Other administrative considerations is, of course, when you're planning your application, what is the mode of submission, right? If it's an online submission, there are homework to be done before you reach that stage, right? So there will be, in some cases, there might, might be your institution has to register first before you can register as an applicant. So if in, it requires institutional registration, you have to ensure that it is there. Personal registration, uh, you as an applicant have to register. And if you have partic other participants in the grant application, maybe the other participants also have to register. So these are some of the considerations when you do uh, online submission. Now, yes, if your deadline for an online submission is uh, 12 p.m. Uh, there on, so uh, on day so and so, you can hit submit on 11.59 p.m., right? 11.59 a.m., it's possible. And I know that most of the people consider deadlines as the absolute uh, time when you have to click. If it is 12, I will click at 11.59. Uh, don't do that. Uh, do yourself a favor when you do online submissions. 11.59 a.m., I can assure you the system will crash, the server will crash, and there are technical glitches that will happen, and you will not have time to resolve this, right? If you aim for a deadline which is say today is the deadline, two days before you try to submit it and you're ready with the submission, you try to submit it, there are technical glitches, there are this tech support on the funding agency side that can help you resolve it. But if you aim for the last minute, doesn't happen because of any technical glitch or because the server went down, you are putting yourself at a disadvantage, right? So deadline doesn't mean aim for it, deadline means that's the very last you can submit, right? Paper submission, you have to be, you have to uh, plan in advance. If there is a paper submission, say it's an email submission and then you have to send out the hard copy. 
then you have to give yourself enough time because you have to give time for the postal system to deliver your grant application in time and the time stamp of the uh, postal office matters here, right? So paper submission, you have to ensure that the grant application in hard copy reaches the funding agency before the deadline. So of course, you cannot aim for 12, 11, 59 because then there's no way that the grant application is going to read the funding, reach the funding agency, right? Final checks before you submit. Uh, Ensure enough time to procure letters of support. Now, this is something that I've not discussed, but there are, especially if they are fellowship application, there could be letters of support or rec letters of recommendation you might need from your mentors or your maybe P PhD supervisor. Make sure that you give them enough time. They are also busy people. They are not somebody who can write, whip up a letter in maybe 10 minutes and say, okay, your deadline is like 11.59, so I'll give you a letter at 11. That's not going to work, right? So you have to give them enough time, you have to respect the time that they will have to put in for putting in a grant in a letter of support. And when you're requesting a letter of support, I always advise that you send your proposal along with it. If, even if it's not the final draft, but at least a draft of your proposal saying, this is what I want to, uh, this, is, this is what I'm proposing to do, uh, and can, can I have a letter of support? And if there are any specific guidelines with respect to what the letter of support uh, or the needs to address, you should give them those points, right? I want a letter from you, this addresses this, 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 a bit of my background, how do you know me, what do you think are my strengths, and how am I a best fit to do this proposed research, right? So if this is the something that you want to do, you can maybe send them a draft about yourself, or you can a draft of the letter, or you can just at least summarize what you want the letter to address and send your research proposal when you uh, ask for a letter of support, right? Uh, Ensure all the fields of the application have been addressed and all annexures are in place. And by annexures are any supporting document that the funding scheme requires at that point of time. Uh, some agencies require lots of uh, supporting documentation, including what is there like a DSIR certification of the institution. You have uh, undertaking from HR, undertaking from uh, accounts, you know. They, they're, they're, that, that requirement varies, so that's just annexures are very customized to the scheme that you're applying for. And ensure that necessary regulatory and eth ethical approvals for your proposed work are either in place or in process or, and likely to be in place at time of award because if it is not, then your grant will not be able to start unless and until you have provided these approvals to the funding agency, right? So the mantra here is that a complete form stands a better chance of success than an incomplete form. And if you have put in so much effort into writing a grant application, putting it together, make sure it's complete so that you give yourself the best chance, right? Now, in terms of planning timeline, this is just a recommendation, but the planning start uh, phase doesn't start just two weeks before the grant application. Your planning starts weeks or months before when you are assessing yourself, your field, your resources, and you're brainstorming your research ideas with your peers, with your mentor, and you're coming up with a solid idea, this is what I want to do, and if I get a grant application, this is my idea. So that's something that you don't start when a grant, a granting agency uh, announces a call. That's something that you do way back before you even think of putting a grant application. What do you want to do, right? And peer review. Now, at least I recommend that you should, <coughs> within eight weeks before the submission deadline, you have identified the funding source, and your outline structure of the application is done, and you start writing a grant application. That is where you put your ideas on paper based on what is the format that the funding agency is asking for, right? Give yourself a few weeks to write, rewrite your grant application, because you will, you will realize when you start writing grant applications, not only about the proposal. Some grant applications will ask you about you because they want to know how you are, what, is, what was your journey, what was your expertise, what do you want to highlight about yourself, why should we consider you? Especially, and this is especially true if you're talking about fellowships, right? You have to stand out from the crowd. And when you stand out from the crowd, you have to talk about yourself and how you stand out from the crowd, right? So you will encounter, and again, I go back to my favorite example of the India Alliance, you will find that there is, so there are 
prepare the budget, arrange for supporting documents. Again, don't, uh, this is not something that is trivial because if you're talking about supporting documentation from your head of the institution, you're talking about supporting documents from other departments, uh, you will have to do a lot of running around unless and until you have an office that runs around for you, uh, which is what we do. Uh, but otherwise, you have to uh, make sure that, you know, you have to coordinate across departments, make, make sure that you don't approach them last minute because they will not be able to do it, right? Uh, then do the final checks and submission in time of the deadline. But again, I emphasize not enough that it should not be the day of the deadline. Don't do that. So ethics of uh, grants writing is just one word which we have encountered. There should not be any scientific overlap. And, uh, and when I say scientific overlap, with previously awarded projects or projects already which are funded in your mentor's laboratory. So the scientific overlap is taken very seriously. Uh, Again, other kinds of overlaps that you should avoid is budget overlap and commitment overlap. So say you have three projects running and you don't have any other manpower on that, right? You, will not, uh, you don't have any uh, JRF or SRF, anybody on that. That means you are 100% doing, uh, doing that project, right? You cannot put in 300% of your time, right? So you have to make sure that when you put in a grant application, you put in resources and make sure that your commitment as a PI on that grant does not exceed 100%, right? And that's very important for you, and that's something that people don't really think of, of when they write in a grant application. Plagiarism is considered very seriously by funding agencies, and more and more, the funding agencies are becoming very vig vigilant about plagiarism. And uh, I know SERB, actually, you have to put in an undertaking saying that it has not been plagiarized, and how have you checked for uh, plagiarism, what software have you used for plagiarism, and what is your overlap, right? So now they are becoming very, very vigilant and asking very clear questions on have you checked for plagiarism and you tell us which, which software you used for checking for, for plagiarism. So make sure that you don't plagiarize. And that includes self-plagiarism. If you're talking about something that you are taking from your own grant app or grant application or uh, thesis for that matter, give it credit where you have taken it from, right? So don't say that this is something I wrote maybe for a, a other paper. I can use it. You can use it. It's not that you can't. But give credit to for, for the source that you have used it for, even if it's your own uh, uh, grant application or your own uh, uh, paper, for that matter. Cite. Give the citations. Right? So again, these are some of the useful resources uh, for grant writing applications. Uh, so with that, I will end my talk. And if there are any questions. I know it's a lot to process, but this is all generic common sense stuff. I hope I've been able to reach out to you. Previous? You can take a picture. I can t give you a PDF of that that you can. Uh, it depends. It depends actually on your field of research also, right? If you are talking about uh, sending it out to peers who are your competitors, then I would not advise it. <laughs> that, that is something that I would not advise. But, you know, it depends on uh, how your interaction with other colleagues are. You know, if you have an uh, interaction, you say that you are, if you have a grant application, I can read it for you, give you feedback. Can you do the same for me? Right? It's something that is built over time. I know it's not something that is generally considered, but that is something that I think is a culture change that should happen because really speaking, you are helping each other, right? And if you are from different fields, you are not really competing with each other also. And if even if you are competing, you are competing, you have to, you, your proposal has to have that standard of quality, right, for it to be considered. So it's okay, right? But uh, I know that at uh, our campus, uh, postdocs can seek feedback from, uh, uh, from experienced researchers, not only from their peers, 
it's a very open culture that you say that I have a grant application, I want to apply for so and so, uh, and this is the scheme, can you give me feedback? And people are open to that. So if you're talking about how realistic it is, it's possible. It is, it is. I know that uh, a lot of people work, among scientists also it's, it's possible. But like I said, it depends on the culture of your organization. It also depends on your personal relationships with others and also how open the other person is to being able to give their time to read your proposal and give feedback. Because really speaking, it is eating into their time, right? And that also, so it's not that you might get feedback from everybody. But maybe you can have a select group of people who are from different fields. So you get different perspectives on your own grant application. That helps. Any other query? Questions? I think I've been too clear, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. with grant applications. Uh, in the Indian system, it's not always that you'll get feedback and I think that's where we lack. Because really speaking, when you say that it helps you hone your research ideas, you know, if your grant application is being rejected, it's not a failure. It's a learning experience, you know. You, if you can get to know why it was rejected, so that next time you write a grant application, you address that particular question and you know that this is, what, this is where my application or my proposal was lacking. But it's not something that uh, in the Indian context, many of these funding agencies, especially if you're talking about postdoctoral fun funding, you don't always get feedback. There are very few f uh, funding agencies which will give you feedback and the India Alliance is one of them, where you get actually feedback for your uh, grant applications. If it's rejected, sometimes you get a feedback of why it was rejected, right? But uh, I think that is something that has not come up yet. It's not like your research publication where it's peer reviewed and if they think that, you know, if you address X, Y, Z, it is okay for publication, so you resubmit. So there you are given specific comments that you need to address and if you can satisfy the reviewer, it gets accepted. Grant application is a one-time deal. You apply and you either get it or you don't get it. There's no scope for going back and uh, I will, you know, make this better and I'll resubmit. That's not how it works. So grant application is a little different. But like I said, if the culture change happens and the reviewers start giving comments back to the, uh, you know, uh, whoever is the applicant and why. But I think that also you have to remember is the, the limitations that the review committee works with. You are talking about a review committee which is probably reviewing 300, 400 applications. And for them to realistically be able to give specific feedback for each application is probably not feasible. So I think that also has to change. That's why your PPT has to be self-explanatory. Not always you get a chance to go and present. Sometimes you, you are asked, some committees will say that, you know, we, we send us a PPT in advance and then we'll give you a five minutes slot to explain your proposal. Yes. yes. So basically what they are asking when they ask you for a PPT is a summary of what you have proposed, right? So maybe that's what they are basing their decision on and they will only if you think, they think that your PPT is done in such a way that it attracts their attention that they might put in an effort to read your full application, right? So then in that sense, then PPT is your marketing literally for your grant application, right? You just make sure that you highlight the points that you want why your application stands out. What, what, what is it that, what is the USP of a grant application, right? If, if it catches their interest, you have a better chance of being funded. Yes.
uh, yeah, well, that's that's actually unethical. I I agree totally. Uh, I don't know how it works in universities. I work in a research institution where these are considered very very uh, seriously. So it's something that we have not had a issue with so far. But if that's a valid concern, then you have to think of who you give out your application for review or feedback before you submit a grant application. So you have to carefully, maybe you don't want to select somebody from your university, you know somebody else from some other institution or another university who's able to give you, you know, impartial feedback without the danger of it being taken up and submitted on their own, you know, so that. No, that's fine, <laughs> I understand. So that's where you, where, where you have to get institutional endorsement and you have to route it through the channels, right? Yeah, the danger is, is real, I think, in some places. But again, if you talk from the ethics point of view, it's the most unethical practice I can think of. Sorry? You have a question? It, I think it depends on your circumstances. Like for example, you have taken up a position as an independent faculty and you're getting, you know, your salary is taken care of, you don't need your salary, but uh, you're getting some sort of startup funds to set up your lab, right? Then I would recommend that, you know, take some time to set up your lab, get your project going before you grant, apply for a grant. But there are occasions where you don't have enough startup funds and you have an ambitious project that you want to embark on because it's something which is new and which is innovative and which is directly in line with what you do, right? At that point of time, you have to also think whether it's a, so that's where going back to other projects to see what kind of work is being uh, you know, supported helps because you can figure out whether they, you think a preliminary, app, uh, some sort of preliminary data would support your, uh, your grant application, is that something that a funding agency is actually looking for? If preliminary data is a requirement by the funding agency, then you will have to generate some amount of preliminary data for your project before you, grant, uh, you apply for a grant. So the timing is actually very specific to what scheme you're applying for and what your circumstances are, right? So say you are do, you are doing a postdoc overseas and you're planning to return to India, right? Then you apply for a Ram Linga Swami or a Ram, a Ramanujan fellowship at that point of time because the requirement is that you apply even before you join a institution, right? So when you're thinking of relocating to India, then you should apply. So th that's why I say it's not that there is a rule of thumb of when you should grant apply for a grant. You should apply for a grant based on your circumstances and what your requirements are for your project. Of course, of course you can. The funding opportunities are varied. Like for example, if you look at SERP, SERB also has startup research grants, right? The startup research grants are very tailored for only people who are within two years of having set up their independent position, right? If you're looking at those schemes and then this just to supplement whatever uh, research you're doing or whatever startup funds you get from your university, that varies from where you are, right? So some may give you maybe 50 lakhs as a startup, some may give you only 10 lakhs as startup, right? And depends on what your needs are. Then you should target these grants, uh, grants which are actually for early career investigators who are setting up their lab. There are specific schemes for that as well. Yeah? They are very different. Patent, patents are very different because patents are based on an idea that is ready to be commercialized. This is this. This could be exploratory ideas, right? This are uh, th this could be fundamental research. Patents are more often than not very translational dependent. And when you are going for a patent application, you already have a technology or you have a know-how which is ready to go into the market or at least ready to be developed for the market. So those applications are very different. For commercialization, yes, there are. 
there are actually, so the DBT, BIRAC arm of DBT actually funds translational research. So it will fund you, so the big grants for example, the biotechnology, uh, biotechnology ignition grants, they are actually pilot projects. So if you have an idea we think that can reach a stage where it can be commercialized, those big grants are good for you. I think you can apply as a institution, uh, uh, as a employee or a student of an institution, you can apply individually as well. And that's just the first stage, that's a pilot project. And then if your pilot project is successful, then they have this whole series of grants which can help you take, which will provide you funding to take it from, you know, a concept to a proof of, so one which will give you a proof of concept of these big uh, biotechnology ignition grants, the big grants are like proof of concept, right? Because they're only 18 months grants. But post, post that, if you want to commercialize, there are several schemes from BIRAC that you can explore.